All right, so first off, I want to put a little bit of a you know, prerequisite for this. Um, you know, first time people see that title, they usually go, failure is obsolete. I thought you learned from failure, and I thought that you know, failure was a lesson. It is. Failure is not literally obsolete. But what I'm going to try and do for you today, and what I'm going to do, wow, this is very blinding. Um, what I'm going to try and do for you today is, um, is, is teach you a strategy that I came up with over the years that I started to apply in different places in my life, including you know, making my wife, for the first time ever, bring tears to her eyes from a gift, and she's very hard to, to have that kind of stuff happen. But using the strategies in life, in my business, with my clients, I've had clients that have used this strategy to make over $2 million, literally with one little change, and was spending $0 on it. That kind of stuff. But I'm going to try and give you a couple examples that you can hopefully apply and get some ideas um, today and try and shrink the, an entire book into 15 minutes. So um, with that, I'm going to need your help because I've never done this speech before. I've never talked about the book because I just didn't know how to say it in such a short period of time. And this is also the shortest speech I've ever given. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of uh, optimization of the actual speaking. Now, I've done that before. And usually what I'll do is I'll kind of use the eye signals and the hand raises and stuff like that to get an idea of um, you know, you know, where you are and, and what, what's going on in your life and what you understand already so I can just skip stuff and move past things or explain things more. So in this case, I'm going to probably, since I'm being blinded a little bit here, I'm going to need your help. I'm going to need your help to, to kind of clap. So for now, just clap so I can get a good control. OK, so that's what it sounds like when everyone's clapping. So let's go ahead. Do, do you actually have a, a clicker? Thank you. All right. So let's clap for the clicker. All right, great. OK, so if I can get it to work. Uh, let's boo. It doesn't work. Boo. Here. OK. All right, so first thing I want to I show you here um, is that you know, you say failure is obsolete, right? What is failure is obsolete? Well, the idea of failure is obsolete is basically, if you could imagine yourself being able to, you know, look into the future, right? And see exactly what's going to happen. Then you know whether or not you're going to succeed or you're going to fail, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, are you interested in hearing about that? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Clap if you're interested. Okay. All right, so it says there for real, right? Obviously, we can't actually put you in a DeLorean. I'm not Oprah from the 25th century. I can't give you all DeLoreans, right? <laughs> but, but what we can do is I can sort of take you through some of the steps that you can use that are very systematic. I'm very scientific brained, and I'll show you a little bit about that and explain to you a little bit about myself. But first, I want to get an idea of you guys and where you're at, OK? So what I do is, is called conversion rate optimization. That's my main role, my real job, right? Um, so who of, you, who of you have heard of split testing? Clap if you've heard of split testing. OK. Clap if you, if you split testing your business actively right now. OK. Good to know. Um, and who, who of you have done a science experiment at some point in your life? Who of you have kids that you've done their science experiment for them? OK, awesome. That, that was what happened with my parents, too. So, so to talk a little bit about, about failure is obsolete, um, now that I know a little bit more about you guys, I'm going to start to tell you a little bit about me and um, go all the way back to the beginning, OK? Now, who of you have, have seen this phone before in the, in the 80s or 90s? OK. So this was a phone that um, my sister had when I was six years old, OK, in her room. She's, she's two years older than me, so she was eight. I don't know why they, my parents gave her a phone. It's still weird to me today. But she had a phone in her room. And I looked at this phone, and I said, that is just so cool. You know, you can see all the wires, and you can see the parts, and you can see the microchip, and, and like, Look how awesome that is. It's like you can see everything that's happening. So of course, I look at it, and I examine it, and I try and figure out what's going on. Obviously, I didn't actually have any idea what's really going on, because it's all just like painted different colors and stuff, right? But the assumption that I made in my head was, well, you know, phones are made up of four colors, you know, the, the yellow, the green, the blue, right, and red. And I was like, OK, so this is sort of the assumption I made. So I was like, but I don't really have any way of proving that assumption. So I just sort of assumed that that's what it was. So then, you know, one day, my parents left the house um, and left me with a babysitter, which is pretty much where I did all the dangerous stuff. And I went into my, my, my sister's room, and I saw how it, like, the wire went into the wall. And you know, I took the little wire out, and I could see the four little colors in the, in the pins, right? And the colors matched the colors on the phone. So I was like, I was right. It must be exactly how phones work, four colors. And it just transmits audio 
somehow between the colors, right? So then I went into my dad's you know, tool chest, which was also something I was not supposed to do because it has like big saws and blades and crazy stuff I shouldn't be close to. You know, but I found out how to get in and I got in and I took a screwdriver and went into a room and unscrewed the wall unit. I took out the thing of the wall and sure enough, behind the wall, in the wall, is these four colors yet again. So another proof that I understood how the phone worked, which you know, is obviously very rudimentary understanding, of course. But after that, I went into my room and I looked in my room and I said, well, you know, wh where's, where's there a you know, phone line in my room? And there, there wasn't any phone lines in my room. But there was this empty wall plate in my room. You know, you've seen those before where they like kind of close off something, right? So I did the same thing. I unscrewed the empty wall plate and I looked in, it's just a big empty hole. And so I reached my little hand in that hole, right? It's kind of scary now that I think about it, right? But I reached my hand in that hole and pulled out the wires that were in there. Sure enough, four colors, again. So what did I do? Well, I took, went into my sister's room, took the wall plate off of her wall, disconnected the little wires, literally stripped the ends of the, of the wire so that I could see little things sticking out like I saw on the other one, plugged them in, screwed them on, put it in the wall, plugged the phone in, picked up the phone, and guess what? Uh, I had a phone in my room, okay? <laughs> so as you can imagine, I, I put the wall plate on her wall, you know, the empty wall plate. I screwed it all into the wall, put it all back. So if you can imagine, of course, she came home later that night because she wasn't there. She was out at a slumber party. And this is real context, okay? She came back, and of course, what happens? Screams, yells, where's my phone? Where's my phone? Right? Makes sense. She came rushing into my room. She said, he stole my phone. He stole my phone. Right? And my parents come in, and they're like, looking at each other like, what the hell? How is there a phone in his room? I thought he didn't have a phone line in here, right? <laughs> Until I wrote the book and put the story in the book, they literally had no idea how the phone got in my room. Um, so just to give you that sort of background story of like, the, the, uh, the way that my brain works, and I think the way that a lot of your brains work, being entrepreneurs is sort of how we do it. We see opportunities, right? We, we learn from our, from our environment. Everyone learns that way pretty much, okay? But the way I, I look at things is I, I basically, everything that I do, I, I reverse engineer it, right? So anything that I've had in my life, my curiosity gets me so much so that I go in and I reverse engineer it. Now, getting into, oh, this is a little picture. You can see someone drew this picture of me, right? Getting, reaching into the wall, okay? So, not, so, Kind of going back to that. So testing, right? How, how much time do I have left? Get an idea. OK. So testing, split testing, for you who didn't know, OK? The idea of split testing is basically that you take two websites, right? You take a website, you make a change to the website, you go up and you put the websites against each other. You send half of your traffic to one website, half of your traffic to the other website, and you find out which one works, right? That way, if you, made an idea, if you had an idea or a new website that sucked, then now you know that it sucks. Or if you had a website idea that was great, you know statistically that it was 36% better than the other website because you're getting the, the actual measurement of it. Okay? So I love to measure things. I love to see how things, you know, general ideas actually apply. Okay? So you know how testing works, the basic idea of testing. But in the book, what we, what we talk about, the method behind failure is obsolete, is the idea that not so much that failure is literally obsolete, but that if you can minimize risk so much so that it's almost impossible for something to fail, you're going to be most likely to succeed, right? So how can you find a way to succeed? Well, you know, split testing is very smart. So if you're not split testing or you're not doing that kind of stuff in your life, you should, OK? But the problem with split testing is that you've already made the other website. So you could have spent $100,000, or in the case of one of my clients, $500,000 on an idea, a product line, a business, a anything, OK? But in your case, we'll probably we'll use a business as an example, and I'll show you one of those, right? So what I teach in this book is the idea of testing before you test, OK? So testing before you test literally means taking the idea that you have, OK? Finding a way to take that idea and put it on a smaller scale as much as you can, but with a real life scenario of how you're going to sell that small, small case scenario, the real one, OK? So I'll give you some examples, right? The two things that you need to know to, 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 to the sort of formula of, of how this works is one big, big word here is behavioral context, just the word we kind of define to explain this to people, okay? Behavioral context, context is literally how you decide how to make that big test, which could be starting a business or in my wife's case, you know, 
buying her the, the ring that made, you know, a present that would make her cry, which ended up being a, an expensive necklace, which was the least expensive gift I had ever given her. Um, and you know, cry in a good way, by the way. Um, <laughs> and you know, starting businesses, launching new product lines, okay? So the important thing to know is that you have to have two different things to be the, the two different things have to be the same between the big one and the small one. You have to have the same audience and the same action, okay? So on websites, that might be something like, let's say you want to launch an entire website and you want to change the whole color to green in the background. That could cost you, say, a thousand bucks, okay? If you can find a way to test your audience and see if they're more likely to click with something green or they're more likely to react positive, positively to green on your website, you could try that in other places. You can try it in your email marketing to see if your customers respond. Or better yet, instead of finding out if your customers respond, you could do it on your actual internet marketing and find out how your prospects respond to the change in the color green. And just test the color green change because you're going to be much more likely if you find out the green react, they react generally better to green, that that's going to work, right? Now that's a very simple example. It's not exactly the same audience and same action, but you want to get as close as you can to the same, okay? So here's an example. How would a dentist use this for a normal product thing, not a website, right? Just normal life business. So let's say we have a dentist and he's saying, you know what, I've got this awesome idea. I want to come out with this new added bonus. I want to start offering teeth whitening. And for me to invest in teeth whitening, it costs $10,000. I have to buy the equipment, and blah, 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 and this is, what it, this is what it is. But for a small new dental practice, $10,000 is a lot of money. I mean, it's a lot of money for me. It's a lot of money for a lot of people, okay? So you don't want to just throw $10,000 away and get the teeth, tooth whitening kit, you know, and the whole process if no one's going to buy it, right? So what do you do? Well, how do we find out if they're going to buy it? One way we could do that is we could literally make a poster that says, get your tooth whitening service. We could take the exact scenario of what we would have done to advertise and talk about the tooth whitening service and tell everyone that it's, we already have it, okay? So we have tooth whitening. Let us know if you're interested. Tell the receptionist if you're interested. Then you give the receptionist a little notepad and you say, every time someone tells you that they're interested and they ask you about it, tell them about it and see if they say that they actually are interested and they want to do it. Then tally the people who say they're interested and the people who actually seem like they're about to buy it and start keeping a tally, right? So all of a sudden, after a while, you realize, one, you know how many people want it. How much did the poster cost you? How much did the little thing cost you on your desk? 100 bucks at most, right? If you're like being really crazy and going to getting it framed by Michaels or something, right? <laughs> so now you've actually taken this big idea of tooth whitening and you've shrunk it down into proving that it's going to work, seeing literally into the future. Because you know we got 10 people out of our 100 people that came in the office today that asked about it. Five of them asked about it so much so that we are really sure they're going to buy it because they actually took out the order form. And when we gave them the order form, because we didn't want to be misleading, we said, it's actually not offered yet, but if you fill out this form, we'll put you on the waiting list. So now on top of that, you also have their information. So when you come out with the tooth whitening thing, you can actually sell it to the people because you already know who's interested. So it's a win-win. So you just saved the $10,000 and you're 100% sure. So what do you do? Maybe you spend $20,000 because you know it's going to work. You put more money into it because you're 100% sure that it's going to happen. Right? Does that make sense? Does it sound good? Yeah, no. Clap if you agree. OK, so there's obviously a lot of different ways to apply this concept and this, mind, this mindset. And what I try to do in my book is kind of give you the idea and sort of how you practice and go through and come up with scenarios in your different parts of your life and your business, your website, and actually apply this idea to minimize you know, your risk so much so um, that you never fail. All right, so here's another example for those of us who didn't catch the whole thing um, that, you know, someone, I wrote this in the book and I didn't actually know this was Lincoln who said this, but um, if you've got, he said something to the effect of, if you've got one hour to chop down a tree, he's going to spend the first 45 minutes sharpening the axe. Very smart, right? Smart? Okay. So when I heard this, I was like, that sounds sort of smart, but it's kind of risky, you know? So what, if he chop, what if he spends 45 minutes doing the thing and then, He's only got 15 minutes left, and it takes 20 minutes. He doesn't know, right? So my, my answer is, and, and on top of that, like, what if it doesn't take 45 minutes? What if there's like a law of diminishing returns, and he just starts sharpening it and sharpening it, and 10 minutes into it, it's as sharp as it can possibly get, right? What's the point of spending another 35 minutes, right? Seems silly, right? So, so what, what would I do? What would be the scenario, okay, in this case? How would you do a test before you test this? Well, 
I would take the ax and I'd go and I'd hit the tree, but not the actual tree I'm going to hit. I'd hit a smaller tree, right? And see how sharp I need to make the ax. See how fast I can knock that small tree down. Then once I know, I say, okay, well, I can make this sharp in 10 minutes and it'll be fine because it's already almost sharp enough. Then I go knock down the tree and at the end of the day, you know, Lincoln's out there still chopping the tree and I'm in, having a beer. <laughs> okay? So that's the idea of, of the whole scenario, okay? That's, the, that's what test before you test is. That's how you can make failure obsolete, okay? Now, just in case, I didn't explain it to you. Clap if, I, if you understood it. Okay, I'm not going to ask the people who didn't understand it to clap because that would be not cool. But if you didn't understand it, my bad. I apologize, okay? But the good news is I've got 15 copies of my book with me and I'm going to give them to you for free, okay? So if you want a book, Later, after the last presentation, let me know and come to the back, and I'll, I'll be back there and I'll give out the first come, first serve. Yeah. All right? Thank you very much. Thank you.